Howdy, I'm Bob Bankin, a NASA astronaut, and today I'm going to talk to you about spaceflight reimagined. I wanted to talk to you to start with uh, the idea in general that becoming an astronaut requires imagination, not only to pick the destination, because you know, as kids we all have dreams of becoming something, whether that's a race car driver or a rock star or even an astronaut like it was for me or something else, but we need to come up with a pathway that allows us to achieve that, that sets us up to go along that journey, that provides the off-ramps uh, to take us to slightly different destinations and then get us back on track to get to that final location. That all takes imagination, and I'm going to talk about some examples of uh, how that's played out for me over the years, and hopefully I'll convince you that our entire pathway is a, a journey that just truly depends on our imaginations. The last few years, I've really focused on something called changing space transportation. We went from a place at NASA where we flew the space shuttles. We assembled the International Space Station with them. I flew on those vehicles a couple of times. And we've transitioned now to a, a time where we don't fly space shuttles anymore. We fly some new vehicles. We had to come up with commercial partners and work with them closely to develop the SpaceX vehicle that I flew on, as well as the CST-100 Boeing spacecraft that hopefully will fly a little bit later this year. Uh, as you all know, the Space Shuttle Columbia, we lost that several years ago, just a few short years after I arrived at NASA, and astronaut safety became paramount, even though it was a wonderful workhorse and, and got us into orbit and built that International Space Station. It was a vehicle that fundamentally had some safety issues, uh, not the least of which was just how much propellant uh, you had to put in one place to launch both the crew and the cargo together and how big the airframe was that had to come back through the atmosphere and the engineering challenges of continuing to do that safely at that magnitude were just, uh, were just almost insurmountable if we wanted to achieve the safety that we hope to have uh, kind of going forward. I flew on the SpaceX Dragon last summer. That was aboard a Falcon 9 rocket, a rocket that during its development flew a lot of satellites into orbit and we were able to leverage that experience, the SpaceX team was, to develop a highly reliable system. The CST-100 on the Boeing side is going to fly on an Atlas rocket. Again, a, a system that's launched satellites uh, into orbit and the reliability is proven by all those previous launches and the engineering data from all those launches informs future decisions. And, and that conscious decision to move away from where we were with space shuttles to something completely different uh, took a fair amount of imagination to come up with a, a way to service the space station. And I'll talk more a little bit later about how we do what we did with a space shuttle with vehicles that look drastically different. Now, there are a lot of technical reasons why we need to reimagine the direction that we're going and, and how we get from point A to point B, but it's also important to take the people along with us uh, as we achieve those destinations, and that takes imagination. It takes your uh, attention to, to think about what they're going through at any given point kind of through the process. And for me, on my third flight, this one with the SpaceX capsule, it's a new vehicle, um, Certainly the perception, if not in actuality, more danger because it was new and no one had ever done it before. And so that was definitely a challenge. I was doing it with a new family. I had a, a young son who had not seen me launch on space shuttles. And so it was important for me to prepare him for that. Think, you know, what he would be going through on the day when, you know, I would be laser focused on achieving our mission of launching the Dragon capsule into space. I wanted him to have a good experience and, and I wanted to set him up for success. So uh, over the years, we did things that made the process of me launching in space seemed familiar to him. We went to Florida, we watched a launch together, I talked about what it would be like for me inside the capsule as I was achieving that or, or going through that, and that really helped him have an enjoyable experience that day, not, not maybe fear of the unknown. It, it seemed normal to him and he was uh, truly comfortable with it. In our family, it's turned out to be uh, pretty great that we followed this path because when I took him to Florida, he insisted that he was I was not going to be able to go on a rocket. He didn't think that was a good idea. But uh, when we brought him home, I had him convinced that uh, I was going to go, and then my wife was going to go, and then uh, it was going to be his turn. He'd be the third person in our family to fly in space. And lo and behold, my wife actually is a, another NASA astronaut. She's scheduled to fly on a SpaceX capsule here in just a few short weeks. And so that's why my message today actually is a recorded one versus one that's live, because hopefully by the time you're seeing this, 
Uh, I'll be focused on, on getting her into space and, and standing on the sidelines while she does that, and, and I'll be with our son. When I talked before about the, the mission of the Dragon capsule and retiring our space shuttles, I talked about the safety of, of the astronauts. The challenge was that since space station was built with space shuttles, it was really prepared to be serviced by space shuttles. There are a lot of components on board the International Space Station that are just big, and they're big because they, they got there with a, with a space shuttle. And so if you want to continue to maintain them, you got to figure out alternate ways in order to do that. And so there are a lot of comparisons that, that point out a Dragon capsule docked to the front of the International Space Station. They'll show a space shuttle and talk about, hey, now we can do what we did before with that space shuttle with this new vehicle. Well, it's really true that a fleet of vehicles does what the space shuttle could do before um, for a couple of reasons. One, there's a, they all have different capabilities. There are vehicles that fly up near space station that are grappled with a robotic arm and then attached. Uh, there are other vehicles that are primarily big cargo vehicles. Uh, there are others that, that are carrying crew that kind of split up that mission uh, a little bit. But it's also the case that the engineers on the ground had to reinvent how we were going to take care of the International Space Station as well. And so some of those large components, we now take apart a little bit and then replace pieces of, or we do a completely different way. And so it's, it's required a complete imagination change or a shift, if you will, for how we were truly going to maintain the International Space Station without a vehicle like the Space Shuttle to, to achieve that. But the team has, has just done a great job doing it, and, and it's really uh, uh, what they used to call the, the mother of necessity has is, is allowed them to achieve what they've achieved. And now that we've needed to do it, they've found a way. In addition to all the things that you need to uh, you know, pick your destination, you have to come up with a smart way to do things, uh, you also have to be ready for the, the changes when they come. And, and that requires kind of a continuous replanning, uh, particularly in the astronaut world, but I'm sure in, in everyone else's careers or even in family lives, uh, things happen, life happens, and you need to figure out uh, a plan to, to do something completely different in some cases. For me and for my partner, Doug Hurley, uh, when we flew on the Dragon capsule, for years, we had planned to do what it says there on the cover of Aviation Week, which was relaunch U.S. human spaceflight from the Florida coast. It was pretty much that straightforward. We were going to launch again on a new rocket from the same place we had launched before. We would check it out at Space Station and then bring it home and, and kind of sign off that capability for the next cruise to then rotate to the International Space Station. Well, Plan B came along in early 2020, and the space station had accumulated quite a bit of work that could be done if they had a few more hands on orbit, and they looked at the experience set that Doug and I brought to the table uh, as astronauts who had flown before on shuttle missions and, and done a lot of that assembly work. Uh, we had robotics or spacewalking experience that they could leverage and so they stretched our 10-day mission for checking out the spacecraft into a longer duration mission uh, between two and four months was what was put on the, on the schedule for us going forward uh, with the primary objectives of, of course, doing all the science that we could on board the International Space Station, but to conduct a, a series of spacewalks to upgrade some equipment on board the International Space Station. Uh, Chris Cassidy, the other crew member that's uh, shown in the picture there, and I went out on four spacewalks and uh, got to achieve something that we never thought was possible when we signed up for our, our flights or agreed to go on the missions that were in front of us. Again, I thought I was going on a 10-day mission. Chris thought he was going up and potentially going to be the only U.S. crew member uh, while we did our short visit, and that turned into uh, both of us getting to the milestone of 10 spacewalks uh, together uh, in the photo that was taken there, which was, it was just something exciting for us and, and something we didn't think was possible, but uh, we jumped on the plan and made it happen given the opportunity. We also had to reimagine what it was like to come home. Um, I had landed on the space shuttle a couple of times. The space shuttle Endeavour launched me from the Florida coast off that same launch pad that the Dragon capsule eventually launched off of, 39 Alpha, um, both uh, at, at nighttime, which was a, a pretty cool thing to be a part of. 
Um, but then rather than come home with one and a half G's on the, on the aircraft and, and that effect on my body after a short duration mission, I came home in a capsule after a couple of months with four and a half or five G's uh, on the reentry and then splashing down in the water, not a firm service, and uh, bouncing around in the ocean for a short period until the recovery ship could get to us. And so uh, definitely something I, I had to think through and be prepared for, the additional G loading, what it was going like, to be like to bob around in the water for that period of time, which was uh, something completely new, something, for me at least, something that we hadn't done as astronauts in the NASA Astronaut Corps for decades. Uh, we got to recheck that test box and uh, looking forward to the crew one team that's on orbit right now getting a chance to be the second ones to do that in, in several decades. One of the things that I mentioned before was uh, uh, trying to prepare your family for coming home or, or, for, or for the experiences they're going to go through uh, when you do something like coming home. And uh, that's a picture of my son who, even after we had done our best to make him comfortable with what it was going to be like when I arrived back in Houston on the fixed wing airplane that brought me back from the Florida coast after the ship had brought us in. Um, he had a chance to come aboard the airplane and spend some time with me before being taken down and, and the kind of the media circus, if you will, that, that followed uh, our arrival was scheduled to happen. So he had gone down and was supposed to be waiting with his mother as I came down the air stairs with our, our flight doc uh, team there. But uh, my, my son, you know, was just couldn't contain his excitement, even though we had done as much as we could to prepare him for that. And he charged the airplane and uh, wanted to give me a, another hug for coming home. And probably my proudest moment is that I didn't fall down those air stairs after he charged me and, and, and nearly tackled me at the bottom of the air stairs in my, you know, post-flight kind of weakened state. And so... Uh, anyway, that was just something that we did our best, but we didn't completely prepare for him uh, for that. I haven't specifically mentioned the, the pandemic um, that we were going through when we launched into space and, and when we got back. And I've done that deliberately, primarily be because it was something that we recognized, we adapted to, and we overcame it. And in the end, it didn't change the mission that we had in front of us. Uh, we were able to accomplish all of our objectives, get the Dragon capsule tested out, uh, accomplish those spacewalks, and come home safely, and, and manage the COVID risk with the appropriate masks and social distancing and, and all those things. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll just put out there that there are challenges in spaceflight. Uh, throwing a pandemic at us was, uh, was another one that we were able to overcome to get to where we got to. And that's really, in a microcosm, what I'm talking about of that journey that you continually have to be willing to, to replan and, and overcome whatever challenges that are out there if you have a true destination in mind and, and are going to get there. This is a, a sequence of photos that I, that I wanted to share with you that showed kind of the, the mindset that we had when I arrived in the astronaut office, which was that we were going to operate in low Earth orbit and we were going to build that International Space Station and that would be where we, we did our work as, as NASA astronauts. There wasn't the talk of further destinations or exploration further out. Um, my class of astronauts was kind of a, a core group that helped accomplished the completion of the International Space Station for the most part, um, to where you can see a, a nice photo of that in, in the middle there. But uh, now we're on to that third phase, the beginning of, of exploration again to other destinations outside of low Earth orbit. And I'm truly excited to be a part of an astronaut office that has a Dragon capsule, a CST-100, um, headed to the International Space Station at the same time that we have SLS and Orion and the Artemis program and, and are talking about a gateway uh, to the moon and a habitat on the surface and being able to go down with a lander to, to get there. And so it's just wonderful to, to think of where we were and, and what we've become and, you know, the limitations, it seems like, are, are truly only folks' imaginations. Again, I wanted to tell you that the, the journey that you're on, just like for me as a child to the chief of the astronaut office and, and three space missions to low Earth orbit and the International Space Station takes imagination. Uh, use yours as much as you can. Thank you.